this video we're going to take a look at the ambulance and what is inside the ambulance, what everything does, and kind of the things that we carry. So let's start with the outside. As we open this first door, we have our stair chair. And our stair chair is really helpful for getting patients down uh, steps that can't walk. It unfolds into a chair and then locks in place. It has these tracks on the back that allow us to slow a patient down as we move down the stairs. So just like these uh, tanks would have tracks, so does a stair chair. And it self-limits, so the heavier a patient is, the slower these tracks move down the stairs which is awesome. Anything that's red is going to move. Notice the red handles, red handle, red handles down here for extension. So it's very versatile and you can adjust the stair chair to whatever you need to fit your patient. Depending on the maker of the ambulance, These stair chairs will fit in different places. So on this one, it sits right beside. And then locks in place so it doesn't go flying around. Wheel chalk. Spare O2 bottles. These ones uh, with the plastic cover on it have 2,000 PSI and they're full. So these are new and full. On the inside of the ambulance we have our gurning position and notice that there's an O2 bottle right up at the top so we can give oxygen right here with a regulator. This straps into place and then there's an O2 key that we can turn on and off or change the O2 bottle. On the underside of this gurney there's a red handle right here and this red handle adjusts the head and then locks it into place so it doesn't move. It can move up a little bit, but not down. So we could switch our patient into uh, supine position, semi fowlers, or high fowlers if they have a respiratory problem. Down here at the bottom of our gurney, we can lift up the feet and put them into a shock position. So now we can try and bring that blood back to the core and increase their blood pressure this way. On the bottom side of this, there's another red handle, press it, and it goes back into supine position. These gurneys are electronic, so we don't have to manually lift up another red handle so something moves. With these ones, we can just press a plus and raise and lower the gurney to our heights that we want. Lock it back in place, and now this gurney is stuck. So we unlock it with that control handle over there, and then there's plus and minuses right here for raising and lowering. They're battery powered, so we have a spare battery right here. And there's also red handles on the sides to raise and lower the armrests. This gurney does not have uh, restraints on the actual gurney, so if we took a look, under the head, we have a patient mover, this is a, a basically a tarp that we can put a patient on and everybody can grab handles. Same thing with this red one. And then we have these little disposable blankets. Same thing down there with the yellow. Um, the pediatric mate you see right here is actually a pediatric car seat. So we could uh, secure a child to the gurney safely. Okay, 
I have my cardiac monitor out here. And the cardiac monitor is a little bit different than my AED. For you guys, we're using AEDs. And that allows the computer to interpret whether or not the patient's in V-fib or ventricular tachycardia. With the monitor, I don't have to wait for the computer to analyze it. I can see the live feed of the heart rhythm right here. And then if I need to, I can uh, defibrillate that, just like the AED would defibrillate, or do other things at a paramedic level. But I have to test this equipment every morning and make sure that it's working. So I'm going to disconnect my cable right here and connect it into a test shock device. And then I'm going to charge my monitor. And then once it's ready, notice that this light illuminated and then I can discharge and you'll see that the shock is delivered and it shows me on the screen what that looks like. So this defibrillator passed, it's working properly, so I'm going to connect it back into the uh, extension leads. Okay, in the same pocket, I have uh, defibrillator leads. So I have adult and I have pediatric. I also have um, a way to re read and register in tidal carbon dioxide. So I have a little carbon dioxide reader in here as well. So over here, I have a blood pressure cuff, SpO2 monitor, and then I have a four lead EKG for putting the patient on the heart monitor. Over here, I have a 12 lead EKG, which allows me to look for a specific kind of heart attack, and it just involves more electrodes on the chest. In this exterior pocket, I've got more pads for different sizes. So I have infant pediatric, adult child, and then another pediatric pad. All of these have um, use-by dates, and the thing about these pads is that the, the sticky gel that conducts electricity kind of dries out, so we have to throw them away at a certain point if they're not used. There's spare blood pressure cuffs in here for different sizes, so I have um, a pediatric size and then a really large size in here. I have an infant and then it looks like a neonate size as well. So a variety of cuffs variety of uh, pads, electrodes, all for different patients. Now this is never going to go back in the exact same way I had it, so that's okay. Good as new. Uh, paper prints over here, so if I wanted to see a printout of my heart rate, or give it to a nurse or a doctor, I can print that heart rate. I can check my battery right here, and then these batteries are replaceable. I just pull one out and put a new one in. I have electrodes for looking at heart rhythms in the back. Some different kinds of electrodes. These ones are for like really diaphoretic patients. And I have pediatric patient uh, electrodes in there as well. a quick look at our Zoll monitor and this is our defibrillator. So once again we don't carry an AED, we just carry this which does everything. It monitors patients blood pressure, SpO2, carbon dioxide, heart rhythm, and then it can intervene with that heart rhythm if needed. So we're going to take a look at our jump bags or our rescue bags is our medical battery. There's going to be some trauma things in here as well, but specifically this is for medical emergencies. So in the outside pocket, I've got one liter or 1,000 cc's uh, or milliliters of normal saline. I have some 10 drop tubing. There's some coband over here in case somebody bleeds. There's an IV kit. And we're going to take a look inside of our IV kit. So I have a bunch of different sizes of catheters, and these catheters are color-coded. So I have orange, gray, green, pink, blue, and yellow, and they're in progressive sizes. So if I look over here at this catheter, I have a very, very large needle. 
This orange one is a size 14, so 14 gauge. And if I compare that to the smallest one, which is my yellow, this is a 24 gauge needle. And it's little tiny needle, very, very small. So this is what I would use for like babies or, or pediatrics. And over here, I would use for someone who was losing a lot of blood, and I have everything in between. Based on the patient, we would choose different sizes for what we need to do. I've got ways to establish um, peripheral lines using a catheter and then using a set of tubing, we can uh, keep that line open. So we can get medications or draw blood, whatever we need to do. Lots of little things in here. We've got our tape, a tourniquet, some uh, non-sterile dressings, some clamps that can hold pressure, and then uh, 10 cc's of normal saline. This is a little plunger. Lots of little things we can do for um, controlling bleeding in here. So this is our IV kit. Let's take a look at our side compartment. We have a sharps container and then a portable sharps container down here as well. So sharps containers, you can throw in your sharp and then just close the top. And these little portable ones are really good for bags because you can lock them in place and make sure nobody gets stabbed with a needle. On this outside pocket, we've got some manual blood pressure cuffs. This one's a little different than maybe ones that you have seen. This is a handheld uh, one that you inflate and then control the dial in the same hand. So it really frees up your other hand. Okay, we're in our front pocket and you notice a lot of trauma supplies. We have OPAs, oral pharyngeal airways. We have scissors. We've got Sharpie for writing, a tongue depressor, a light for checking pupils. We've got some normal saline, a drip set, an SpO2 sensor, lots of trauma dressings. This is a new one that I haven't showed you guys. This is a petroleum dressing. So on the inside of this, it has uh, gauze and it's covered in petroleum oil. And that's going to do a really good job sealing something. But it won't stick to the patient. So if you have burns, it's a really good call. Um, or if you wanted to make an airtight seal, it's also a good thing to do. This is really interesting. This is a Roslo chart or a pediatric resuscitation chart. You put the red side at the top of their head, and then as you lay the child down, their feet will end up a certain place. So let's say they ended up in purple. It gives me uh, dosages for medications. It tells me equipment sizes, and if I flip it over, It'll give me um, lots more information on what I need to do for a serious uh, pediatric call. It also gives me their approximate weight, so 10 kilograms, 11 kilograms. Very helpful. I'm a big fan of the Braslo chart. Any critical uh, pediatric patient, I will just uh, set this Braslo chart right next to the patient. And if I need to administer medications, this is very um, time saving for me as well as assurance that I'm doing the proper thing at the right moment. So I've got a spare set of goggles over here, some more saline, some abdominal pads. I've got a sling and swath, some more Coban. This is a tourniquet, some extra tape, some regular gauze, I've got some cold packs in here and hot packs. Let's take a look on the inside. This is my medication bag. So when I open this up, you can see what kind of medications that we carry inside the bag. So I have albuterol in my hand, a bronchodilator, so somebody who has constricted uh, lung sounds, we're going to use that. Right here I have glucagon. Glucagon is separated and is found in a wafer form, 
So this one has to be uh, mixed with the water to reconstitute the glucagon prior to administration. I have aspirin for chest pain patients. I have nitroglycerin in a paste form. So I can use nitroglycerin in a paste or I can use it in a pill form. And if I look at the pill form, it says 0.4 milligrams per tablet nitroglycerin sublingual. So I know I'm going to use that for my cardiac chest pain. If I use the nitroglycerin paste, I have to put that paste onto um, a little sheet and then adhere that sheet to the patient's chest. So if I did that, I'm going to use one of these sheets right here and put it on their chest. Over here, I have um, ondansetron, which is Zofran, so it's a medication for anti-nausea. And then the same thing right here. I have Zofran for injections. So this one's PO per oral, and this one's for injection. Okay, let's see what else we got. I have adenosine. This is for a heart rate that's uh, very, very fast. So a supraventricular tachycardia. So I have medication for that kind of situation. I've got some uh, twin packs to pull up medications. And then I have adrenaline or epinephrine. So this is one milligram, one to 1,000 epinephrine. And this is gonna be for your patient who has uh, anaphylaxis or severe difficulty breathing. Down here, along with the Benadryl, or sorry, along with the epinephrine is Benadryl or diphenhydramine. And this is an antihistamine medication to help reduce that swelling and prevent it from getting worse. So I've got the epinephrine for bronchodilation and vasoconstriction, and then I have the Benadryl for the antihistamine factors. So a lot of medication carried right here. I can handle a low blood sugar, um, a bronchoconstriction, a chest pain, nausea vomiting, supraventricular tachycardia, anaphylaxis, or extreme difficulty breathing. Bunch of medications. I have a glucometer for checking blood sugars. And I just want to make sure that I have test strips inside of here, and I do. I also have lancets for poking uh, through the skin and getting that little drop of blood and putting it into my monitor. And then my monitor will read that blood glucose and tell me what uh, our number we're looking for. So last one checked was 95 milligrams per deciliter. One for that, 141. So it logs and saves those, those uh, little data sets for me. So if I forget, I can just check. Okay, COVID, I've got a uh, touchless thermometer. I've got some splints right over here. I have a way to administer albuterol, and this would be to administer albuterol for the patient holding it or if I wanted to put it into a bag valve mask. I've got dextrose D10, so this is 10% dextrose solution. This is 25 grams of dextrose. A way to administer that into an IV port, and then I have some vomit bags. You just fold those open and somebody can vomit into it and it doesn't get all over the place. Right here, I have an easy IO drill. And this is so that we can drill a needle into somebody's leg and give them medication. So it just looks like a little hand drill. And you press it, it spins. There's a magnetic tip right here. And these needles magnetize into it, and then it drills into the leg. So I have adult size, I have pediatric size, and then I have, oh my gosh, that's a giant leg size. So three different sizes, and then based on the patient, we'll choose the right one. So this drill is working. I'm gonna put it back into place. I've got my saline, I've got my iodine, I've got my uh, stabilizer kit, so we can lock it into place on the leg. And this kit is ready to go. Okay, so we've got some more medications in here. We have calcium chloride for a potential calcium uh, channel blocker overdose. We've got some gluca, or excuse me, glucose. So 15 grams of glucose. And it looks like we have two different flavors today, grape and lemon. I've got some sodium bicarbonate 
for is somebody who has an acid problem. We could reduce that um, acid in their system. I have epinephrine 1 to 10,000. So we talked about epinephrine 1 to 1,000. This is epinephrine 1 to 10,000. And this is going to be used for someone in cardiac arrest. So we can give this medication to somebody and try and make their heart restart. We've got atropine. Atropine works against the parasympathetic nervous system. So it does a very similar job as epinephrine. It's going to raise the heart rate, increase blood pressure. But instead of working as a sympathomimetic, this is a parasympatholytic. So it's doing the opposite. And when we talk about homeostasis, there's two systems. We have the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. This is sympathetic. This is parasympatholytic. So these both do the same thing, but they work on different systems. And in pharmacology, it's nice to have a variety of routes to try and get the correct patient outcome. There's our atropine for slow heart rates. We have lidocaine, which is an antidysrhythmic. So if somebody's heart is fibrillating or doing something that shouldn't be doing, we can try and calm down that heart and um, reduce the spasming. We have Narcan, which is one of your uh, medications. So naloxone is our drug name. Our trade name is Narcan. And this is two milligrams per two mLs. There's two milligrams in each of these vials. We can give that intranasally with a mucosal atomizer device. Once again, we want to make sure that none of this stuff shifts around as we're driving. So we lock it into place. Make sure that nothing falls out. This is my airway bag. I have a tube tamer for endotracheal innovation. I've got um, an intidal CO2 detector, colormetric. I have an esophageal detection device to see if I'm in the esophagus. I've got some spare masks over here. I have nasal pharyngeal airways. Nasal pharyngeal, nasal pharyngeal. And then it looks like I have, nope, still nasal pharyngeal airways. Oral pharyngeal airways, nasal pharyngeal airways lubricant, lots of basic airway supplies here mixed with some advanced airway supplies. Glasses, so that way when you're in that person's face, you don't get spit all over. On the outside pocket, I have two um, critical interventions for a paramedic. I have a needle cryposynthesis cri uh, and then a needle thoracentesis. Um, the needle crike is for going into the neck and opening an airway, and then the needle thoracentesis is to uh, decompress a tension pneumothorax in the chest. Over here, I have my advanced airway supplies, and then I have more of those tube tamers, another color metric thing. So we're going to take a look at the innovation kit. So this one has a pediatric handle and an adult handle. With my hand size, I prefer the adult handle. At the bottom, they just lock into place very simply. So you just click, pull, turn, and then your light's going to come on. There are two C batteries in here. You just unscrew this top and then the C batteries you can replace. So what I want to look at is I want to take a look at this light, make sure it's white, bright, and tight. It's not loose sitting in there. So this is a Mac 4 or a Macintosh 4 blade. It doesn't tell me, but oh, there it is, Macintosh 4. I can change that out to a different blade if I want. This is um, a grand view blade, so just a different style. It's kind of a mixture of a straight blade and a curved blade. 
I can also take uh, this handle over here and I can look at my other blades and see if they're all working. So I have a straight blade, white blade tight, straight blade, white blade tight, it's a little bit smaller straight blade, some Miller 2, white blade tight, and then I can move into my curved blades, Miller, or excuse me, a Macintosh 3, there's a Miller 1, that's a Miller 1, or 0.5. We have a Mac 2, and then we have a Mac 1. So depending on the airway size, we can choose a different blade that fits that patient's anatomy. I have more OPAs over here. On the inside, I've got another tube tamer, spare glasses, another esophageal detection device, and a color metric device. Over here, I have McGill forceps. So I have two different sizes. I have a small and a large. And then I can use these in one hand and my laryngoscope in the other to pull something out. And I can use them however my hand will fit inside that mouth. With these, I just want to make sure that they make a tight seal at the end so I could actually grab something if I needed to. I want to be able to grab and pull. Those are my McGill forceps. This is a flexible suction catheter, also called a French tip suction catheter, as opposed to this, which is a yonker or a rigid tip suction catheter. So this one is flexible going down a tube or suctioning out a, um, a crike, a surgical crike on someone's neck. Then I have a variety of tubes over here, and these are our endotracheal tubes. This is a size 5. They have expiration dates as well. 22 is when this one goes bad. And we want to make sure that the package is intact, there's no holes. I'm going to go through my various sizes, make sure I have them all in order. So I start at a 5, and I go all the way up to an 8.5, and a size 9 vector. So 5 to a 9, and then based on the patient's size, we're going to choose one that fits them appropriately. Alright, so I've got my tubes back in here. I've got my tape over here if I need it, my McGills are back in place, and all of my preferred bulbs are working and tested, so I'm happy with this kit. Okay, let's take a look on the inside. In the outside pocket, we have an adult bag valve mask. We have a CPAP, continuous positive airway pressure for a size small face. We have a pediatric bag valve mask. Excuse me. We have an infant bag valve mask and a pediatric bag valve mask. We also have some different things to give nebulized medications like albuterol right here. Okay, over here we have a large uh, CPAP, continuous positive airway pressure. We have another uh, way to give albuterol right here. We have an O2 tank down at the bottom. And we're going to look at our pressure gauge. This one's currently off. So we're going to use our um, 
O2 key and turn it on, and we're at 2,000 PSI. And I can bleed off that oxygen and watch that gauge go down. There we go. So O2 is back off. We can turn it on when we need it. But I bled it out so it didn't look like the O2 tank was on. I don't ever want somebody to connect and then not know that it's not running. Um, albuterol, non-rebreather. Albuterol is a pediatric non-rebreather, pediatric nasal cannula, adult nasal cannula, and then we have those end-tidal CO2s to check carbon dioxide readings. And then we have a simple mask for a newborn. Lots of different ways to give oxygen. So that's our advanced airway bag. Okay, let's take a look at our wall. We have another glucometer right over here for checking blood sugar. A place to put sharps so that they don't fly around the ambulance. There's some more storage under here. This is our splint system. So we can splint um, broken arm, broken leg, whatever we need to do. Down here, this is a Sager traction splint. We have a burn kit. We have some spare uh, COVID precautions right here. We have some rigid um, cardboard splints that we could use. This is a Kendrick extrication device right here. A pediatric long backboard and then some spare blankets. We've got lots of tools that are stored pretty much everywhere. Oh, almost forgot to put my scarf back. Okay, so just like the bags had lots of medications in them, so do the walls. So we have that epinephrine, we have the Narcan, we have lidocaine, we have atropine, we have calcium, we have um, the sodium bicarbonate, and then there's a couple more medications in the wall that we didn't see um, in the bag. So here's some transexamic acid. This is to make somebody uh, stop bleeding. There's some more TXA back here. There's some dextrose back here. We have some activated charcoal right here. And this one is in a tube. So let's take a look at it. We have 50 grams of activated charcoal, and we do the same thing. Shake this, mix it up really well prior to administering. And that'll be one gram per kilogram. There's some more just normal saline for mixing medications in. Over here, I've got an IV start kit, and I have that medication bag just like I did inside the jump kit. I have my same medications in here, so I can give those medications from the wall without having to go into my bag. Here's some stuff for starting IVs right up top, and I have the needles right there. Down here, I've got an OB kit, so an obstetric kit for giving birth. I've got some toys for kids. Um, I have soft restraints right here if we had to restrain somebody. I have some suction things right here, bag valve masks, and some spare saline. Over there we have some basic airway mixed with some advanced airway. So in the back I have endotracheal tubes. In the front I have nasal cannulas, non-rebreathers, adult pediatric, some nebulizers, and some N95 masks as well as CPAP over there on the end. This is an IV bag warmer so I can give uh, warm saline instead of cold saline. So if somebody who has hypothermia, I can give them warm saline. I have suction on the wall, as well as a portable suction that I could bring in to a house. I have a spare battery for my monitor right up top, as well as pretty much everything else that's inside that monitor is inside this cabinet. So spare pads and things like that. Up top, it looks like I have some BLS supply. So hot packs, cold packs, blood pressure cuffs, saline, different sizes of dressings, and then Coban, some vomit bags, things like that. Right here, I have a pressure bag, so I can give uh, an IV bag under higher pressure if I need to. I've got shavers for hairy chests if we have to take a picture of someone's heart. Another burn kit right over here. Some large trauma dressings for lots of bleeding. 
burn sheets over here, some disinfectant cleaning stuff, and then some basic ambulance necessities. So I have these are called chucks. They're absorbent pads, also called puppy pads. And then I have uh, the spare battery we talked about earlier. And I've got gloves up top. The ambulance is also versatile in the sense that I can put my IV bag on certain things and I don't have to hold them. The gurney also has one. And I can raise up an IV pole so that the gurney itself can hold the IV. The telescope's back into place and locks back down. Uh, I can control certain things back here. So I can turn on lights. I can use the radio to talk to either dispatch or a hospital. And I can control fan settings. I keep narcotics right up here. And then I've got seat belts all throughout the ambulance as well. So I can sit behind the patient or next to the patient, depending on what that specific person needs. The ambulance has a large O2 tank as well. This one is kept in the side. And we'd have to open this back door to see what our current level is at. But I know that it's at 1800 because I already checked it. Uh, these doors over here are pretty cool. So you can lock them. So if you're on scene on the highway, this door can't open or shut when it's locked. Or if I need more space, I can unlock it and bring it all around to the side. So whatever you need to do, these ambulances are made to be versatile. All right, that's a good little walk around. Let's take a quick look at the uh, lights. So we're gonna look at the code three lights and make sure that they're all working. sides. I also have these ones to illuminate scenes at nighttime. I want to be visible. Got my lights up top, lights on the sides. Let's see I didn't turn these ones on. And I'm walking around making sure that everything is working. These are part of my EMT duties. that you know what it is and where it's located. So that way you can retrieve it if needed. 